my health was at an all time low to a point I didn't enjoy the person that was looking back at me in the mirror. You know, I wasn't really comfortable in the clothes that I was wearing. I just wasn't comfortable in my own skin. And that's quite, I just felt really low at that point. Um, In that same year, um, I did lose my father as well. And that was almost four years ago now. So to top it all up, there was a lot of grief. There was a lot of changes that were going on in my environment that actually was the icing on the cake to all the issues that I chose to ignore or didn't know what I was doing or thought I was doing the best that I could, but realised that by the end of that year, I had to choose a different way of looking at my health. Welcome to the Radical Health Rebel podcast. I'm your host, Lee Brandon. This work started for me several decades ago when I started to see the impact I could make on people, helping them to identify the root cause of their health problems that no doctor could figure out including serious back, knee, shoulder and neck injuries, acne and eczema issues, severe gut health problems, even helping couples get pregnant after several IVF treatments had failed. And it really moves me to be able to help people in this way. And that is why I do what I do and why we have this show. In this week's edition of the Radical Health Rebel podcast, Shim Ravalia of The Gut Intuition shares her own story of gut infections and depression the link between gut health and mental health via the gut-brain axis, how she uses her own experience to help others overcome their own gut issues and to help them realise their physical and mental potential to achieve great things in life. Enjoy. Shim Ravalia, welcome to the Radical Health Rebel podcast. Thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Lee. How's it all going? It's all going very, very well. Good stuff. So, Shim, we're going to be discussing gut health and how it's linked with depression. Yeah. But to kick things off, would you share with the audience a little bit about you, your own story around gut health and perhaps mental health? Yeah. And also your career and the types of clients that you work with. Absolutely. Like if if I take you all back to 2012 is when I first set up my very first business, which was all about sports therapy. So essentially working with physical health a lot more. And I did that for a good six years of, you know, mending people's backs and shoulders and all those office workers that just spent loads of time at the desk. And I always felt in that moment, uh, especially in the sixth year of running that business, I was like, there's more to this because people kept coming back to see me. Mm. And I started to link emotional health to physical health. And I really just went down this rabbit hole of understanding actually the physical symptoms are messages that our body are giving us so mm-hmm. i need to understand what's going on like how i well, why does this person keep coming back every 3 to 6 months to see me with for the same problem so from there on i kind of went on this journey of my own body so to speak um having been a business owner for about 11 years i've been through many uh ups and downs Uh, through sort of depressive modes to highs and lows to burnout to trying to find what this work-life balance stuff is all about that people keep chasing but never seem to be getting anywhere and yeah exactly quite a popular subject still and um you know essentially I found my own middle with it because by the end of 2018 my health was at an all-time low to a point I didn't enjoy the person that was looking back at me in the mirror. You know, I wasn't really comfortable in the clothes that I was wearing. I just wasn't comfortable in my own skin. And that's quite, I just felt really low at that point. Um, In that same year, um, I did lose my father as well. And that was almost four years ago now. So to top it all up, there was a lot of grief. There was a lot of changes that were going on in my environment that actually was the icing on the cake to all the issues that I chose to ignore or didn't know what I was doing or thought I was doing the best that I could, but realised that by the end of that year, I had to choose a different way of looking at my health. No longer a diet plan, a nutritionist, a personal trainer to kick my ass in the gym. Any of that stuff worked anymore. Like, And that was in itself, being in the health and wellness industry for nearly 20 years, was a very, um, how would I call it? self-defeating feeling so I was like hang on a minute I'm a health professional why can't I get this right what the hell is going on with my body so I had to seek other ways of understanding my body at that time and this is where the whole gut health journey started for me because I was carrying an infection 
And for those of you that want to know what this infection was called, it's got a very fancy name called Klebsiella oxytoca, which is a type mm-hmm. of bacteria uh, family. And unfortunately, it went, it went kind of the other way for me, which it was festering as an infection, caused all sorts of problems, signal failures in my body, a lot of inflammation, a lot of dysfunction. And I had to use that time for a good three to six months to really come out of the other side. So I had to, you know... Keep, get, get my diet a lot better, eat single ingredient foods, get to bed on time, sleep better, sleep hygiene all cleared up. Uh, look at my environment within my home to understand that, you know, what's what could possibly be causing a lot of dysfunction because it's never just one area. Mm. And I started to realize that, hang on a minute, so many people in my world, even my friends and family, have got gut problems, IBS not sleeping well or got skin flare-ups, losing hair or, you know, um, memory loss. Have you ever walked into a room and you've gone, what the hell am I doing in this room again? And we find it so hard to recall that memory, like foggy brain, all of this sort of stuff. And I'm like, hang on a minute, I might be onto something here. And that's where Mm. the gut intuition was born purely through my own mess of how mm. I treated my body at the time, my emotional health, my mental health at the time as well. Um, I'm a doer. I, I love building businesses from scratch. I love helping people. So for, for many years, I was always doing, I was always in it. I was always thinking of the next best strategy of the next uh, next level to take it through. But I never actually once stopped and gone, let's take a breather. Let's take a pause point. I always just wanted to achieve the next level. And I think that's the downside of being an overachiever, you see. It's just like you just constantly want to mm-hmm. keep the momentum going. But I learned, I, I learned it the hard way. And, you know, had I carried on and not dealt with the infection at the time, I wouldn't be doing this podcast right now. I'll tell you yeah. that. You know, so it's an absolute game changer. Yeah. So you had kind of like a a depressive time in 2018 when when did you get the infection i found out by november that year and I, the reason why i took action because i wasn't sleeping mm. i remember doing a facebook live talking about a particular topic i can't remember like time versus money something like that and i had to end it in less than 10 minutes and cut it short because i was i was feeling this burning really severe burning sensation in my stomach and after I, I remember after I ended that Facebook live, I was cowered over my bed in pain. Then I knew something's got to be done. I just, I just, mm. there was no way that I wanted to continue that way because I wasn't sleeping. Everything that I was eating, I was reacting to. Can you imagine, like, just the simplest things I was just constantly reacting to? And I wasn't, there's no enjoyment. And I, I just made the choice. I don't want to continue down this road. I'm actually going to do what it takes to get better because this is essentially my own mess and it's my responsibility to do something about mm-hmm. it. Before that, Lee, I did go to the doctors in the NHS to find out what was going on. And I got prescribed Gavin Scon. Mm. I was really disappointed. I was like, that's it. You're not going to ask me any other question. This was a less than five minute appointment. And unfortunately, that's just the way the system is at this moment in time, hence why we do what we do. But at that time, I was just like, we've got this at home. Why am I getting more of it? I'll find another yeah. way. But, you know, I carried on doing what I needed to do, but it festered into an infection later on. And then I was forced to do something about it because it was so, so painful. Mm. So, yeah. So so you didn't get a good response from the medical field what what was your next step my next step so a couple of mentors that I was working with from from an emotional point of view and a functional medicine point of view and that's essentially the road I went down and now I work with a good quality functional medicine practitioners with the gut intuition to give a more holistic approach as to what's going on we're not just talking physical health like lab tests and as much as we love to geek out on those type of tests but at the same time looking at what's going on emotionally and mentally so i'm in talks with uh some counselors as well who believe that gut health is a close link to um some mental health conditions because they're huge advocates of that not everybody looks at gut health in a way that um some people just look at it as a standalone thing but you know actually seeing it that if we look at gut health 
and look at emotional and mental aspects of our bodies, then we can see that everything is actually quite well connected. Mm, absolutely. You know? so, so you mentioned the gut intuition. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So the gut intuition essentially helps a lot of men and women who are really driven, overachievers, on a bloody mission to, to do good in the world. But, you know, essentially, I love helping people have less stress in health and in their business, but actually get more razor sharp clarity and focus. And the reason for that is that they can carry on with their vision, their mission, and leave a legacy without actually burning out. If we look at Steve Jobs, he worked and worked and worked, created a lot of changes in the world. But if you think about his last five five years of his life, was just kind of deteriorated and essentially passed away at a very young age. Um, so, you know, it's it's about sort of giving people, the gut intuition exists to give people the right balanced information, the no BS approach to, you know, this is this is how you do it. And the reason why most people don't do a lot of this work, because it's not sexy enough, mm. to be quite honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Today I got a, uh, a message through from a family member yeah. <clears throat> saying that another family member had been told that they had to start taking a specific medication. Okay. So my comment to the family member who messaged me, I said something along the lines of, so what this person could do instead is eat a healthy diet, cut down on sugar, cut down on alcohol, do a little bit of exercise, mm. um, go to bed earlier. But no, they have to take a medication. Yeah. And that's what then that's what you were saying, right? People just don't want to do these things. People don't want to do it. And I think also we live in a cultural world where it's, everything's instantaneous. Mm. Like, I don't know if you've heard of these supermarkets called Gorillas. No. And it's, there's some here in East London, and it's literally... I know the, I know the band. Know the, the, band. band. the band's better than this, but um, <laughs> essentially it's literally you order it online, your fruit and veg, and within 10 minutes it's at your door. So you don't even have to move. Your body, the human body, is designed to absolutely move. Mm. Like, if we think about the lymphatic system, like a bit like pipes in a house, in order to keep them nice and clear, you've got to move. You've got to keep that system moving, pumping. It doesn't have its own pump. That's yeah. why it helps with the immune system. That helps with our clear thinking and, and all that sort of stuff. But if we're not moving and we're constantly just sat at our desk and going, yeah, I don't need to go out. Everything's ordered to my door. What happens then? We're not interacting with anybody. That affects our mental state. Our environment is the same environment, the same walls that we see every single day. Where's the creativity part of our brain going? Where is it even thinking? Yeah. You know, we're seeing the same thing every day. We're not exercising inside out, if that makes sense. So yeah. I think, you know, that's essentially why I do. That's why the gut intuition exists. That's why I do as many podcasts like this, the opportunity to just express my views, uh, express my expert opinions about this topic, because it's getting alarmingly loud every single day as to the lack of movement, uh, the, the the lack of good quality ingredients in our diet these days, even though it's, it's you know, it's available. Um, people are just not sort of thinking in that way. We're still wanting this instant fix all of the time. Hence why your family friend got the, the answer of, no, you have to take this medication. No, you don't have to. And I think mm. if we're talking from mental health conditions, the word should and you have to are two very dangerous words. Yeah. So, so yeah, great question. Yeah. yeah. They're, um, you know, I should have or I have to. The doctor should says. Always be, should always be replaced with I choose to. I choose to, yeah. Because yeah. then you're taking responsibility for your own decisions. That's it, 100%. 100%. Yeah. And I think... Half the problem, and I think this might be very thought provoking for some people, but half the problem is that we listen to the white coats too much mm. and we hand over that control every time the doctor tells us something like you should or you have to or take this and let's see if it doesn't work, come back and I'll give you something stronger. The question is, why didn't it work in the first place? Not just add the same thing again, but multiply it by 10 times. 
Yeah. You know, and I think the, the minute we hand over control, we're, we've kind of lost the battle of taking control of our bodies, the home that we essentially live in. But I think it's just understanding that you do you do have choices. That's the most important part. We have choices and we've got choices to to go down this road or that road. Essentially, you're making that choice for yourself and no one's doing that for you. Yeah, I know Stephen, Stephen Covey said, responsibility is having the ability to respond yeah right not the ability to take orders yeah right that's 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 the opposite of responsibility that's being dependent that's like being a child really yeah but that's how you know a lot of people have been conditioned to think sadly Mm. but i think um where we got a lot of professionals um within the uk and obviously elsewhere like doctors and specialists and surgeons and all that sort of stuff I just think the system itself creates a lot of codependency behavior. Mm. It's like they want people to keep coming back, keep coming back. If it doesn't work, come back. We'll think of another medication to put you on something a bit stronger. So you'll see you, you can feel the effects. And sometimes with our clients, um, they might not feel the effects, but they can see the outcomes within three to six months. Do you see what I mean? Like um, a lot of people go, I want to feel different in in like the minute I take this medication. And essentially that's not how it how it always works with the holistic approach. But yeah. I always laugh and joke with my clients. I said, I don't ever want to see you again. And they're like, what do you mean? I was like, well, <laughs> the, the, the way we've taught you, the way you have taken action and implemented, it works with your lifestyle. It works with who you are as a person. That's the most important bit. You're not a number. That's not the way we work, but you're a person. Um, how you think, how you feel, your biochemistry, it's so unique to the next person. But what you've got is now the map that works every single time for you and no one else. So it's never a cookie cutter approach. And that's the unfortunate side of how we approach mental health, how we approach physical health, emotional health. There's like so many labels around it that people think you've your doctor just diagnosed you with um uh, let's say depression you're in this camp now mm. you've got this label so therefore you're going to go down this medication route you're going to go down this many sessions of counseling uh, within the nhs and then uh, and then we're not sure what happens after that we'll, we'll see how we get on great mm. fantastic great job and that that actually yeah. sorry to say but pisses me off a lot yeah Whereas really, I'm sure you would agree, the question that needs to be asked is why are you depressed? Yeah. Right. And then that takes investigations, which the NHS will say, that's too expensive. Yeah. We can't do that. Yes. Yeah. Right. Which means it's not a service. It's, you know, it's a, it's a money generating machine. That's what it is for, for predominantly the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. hundred percent. And that's, that's where big, the biggest, biggest red flags lie in this mm-hmm. approach. And when you were saying earlier, you know, jokingly, you were saying to, you know, to your clients, oh, I never want to see you again. <laughs> you know, what, what, and that's exactly how I work as well, yeah. is that, you know, what, what we do is that we empower people not to need us, not to have to rely on us anymore. We teach them what they need to know so they can look after themselves. Yeah. They can take the responsibility for their own health, yeah. right? I agree. Rather than be reliant, you know, in this country on the state for your health. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think it's about being independent in your own choices, like we spoke about, like codependency to a level. Yes, especially when someone's starting out and they don't know. But essentially, you've got to let them fly and do it by themselves. Mm-hmm. Not, no, it's okay. We'll keep you coming back, so you stay with me. You stay with me, and you keep spending money with me all the time. Um, I just don't think that's the best productive way of helping somebody. Yeah. and it's not the ethical way it's not the ethical way either it's about empowering them not disempowering them yeah 100%. absolutely yeah so my first kind of deep question for you i guess yeah how would you define depression that's a great question i'm not going to give like a textbook answer because essentially i want to give an answer that has been my experience and some of my clients experience as well and through conversations um Depression is is a way to look inside. Mm -hmm. Depression is an opportunity to understand what you need to do next 
to actually scale up. Scale up meaning what you can do better than where you are right now. Mm. It's a chance to look inwards because everything that we do and essentially everything that I've done for the past 11 years is always looking at the inside first before we look at the outside. And I find that a lot of people look at the outside and not the inside enough. So it's all very surface level. It's never like, well, what's going on inside? Because that's that's the reflection of what's going on outside. So I think depression, my my version of that is an opportunity to look at yourself inside out. What's yours, Lee? When 35-year-old Amanda first scheduled to see me, she'd been suffering for 19 years from severe IBS, diarrhea and faecal incontinence, along with abdominal pain and bloating. Her condition had not only made life uncomfortable for Amanda, but very inconvenient as she had to walk two hours to work every day along a route that had public toilets, and she'd never been on holiday as an adult because of her condition. The only advice that several doctors and specialists had given Amanda was to take Imodium, and when she first saw me, she was taking five Imodium a day and wasn't getting any better. To help Amanda, I ran tests to find out what foods were right for her metabolic type, to see which foods she was sensitive to, and to assess her gut microbiome. Tests showed that Amanda had several food sensitivities and a parasite infection. Over the coming weeks, I coached Amanda to eat right of her type and to replace the foods she was sensitive to and a protocol to deal with her parasite infection. And after three months, Amanda was IBS free and she also reported her skin was much improved and she had lost weight. And she booked a holiday for her and her husband to New York as they'd never been on a proper honeymoon because of her IBS. And if you're suffering like Amanda was, and you want to get to the root cause of your problem, you can arrange a consultation with me at www.bodycheck.co.uk. And if we're a good fit, I could help you achieve the same kind of results as Amanda. Now, back to the podcast. Well, it's interesting what you're saying. The way that you answered that question is almost exactly the same way I would answer what is pain. Yeah. Right. What is pain? It's an opportunity. Well, I would say the, what, what pain is ultimately is your subconscious mind making your conscious mind aware that there's something wrong. Mm-hmm. Right. Like if you step on a nail, you get a signal via your nervous system to your brain to say there's something sharp. If you keep pushing down on that, it's going to damage your foot. Yeah. So you stop. Right. Or, you know, again, the, another story that I've told lots of times, you know, it's not just pain. It could be a, any illness. Right. So, you know, the one that I've probably told the most is, you know, because of my own personal and professional experience, if someone has acne, it's your subconscious mind saying there's something terribly wrong on the inside of your body. Mm. I'm showing you on your face. So you take notice and you need to do something about it. Yeah. So it's interesting. You kind of use the same analogy for depression and I'd never thought of that myself before. So that that's quite nice, but I mean, my own my own definition. I had to look it up. I've got to be honest. I looked it up before we spoke today. Yeah. Um, and it, you know, one of one of the things that it's, you know, obviously said it's it's uh, when someone has a low low mood. But the thing that really stood out for me, which I'd never kind of thought about with depression, is when someone no longer gets joy from those things that they used to get joy from. Mm-hmm. I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah. I'd never thought of it like that. So yeah. Anyway, we've set we've set the scene yeah. of what depression is. Absolutely. And and now we're going to get into the real meat and potatoes. <laughs> so, what connection is there between gut health and depression? What would you say is the link between the two? So, if we look at the gut and the brain, so we've it's been it's been thrown around a lot like a lot more now it's getting more and more popular the gut brain connection or the gut brain access gba all of that sort of stuff both of them are essentially intimately very very much linked okay um so i want you to imagine between the brain and the gut there's like a massive telephone pole and they're talking to each other the whole time so whatever signals the the, the gut is giving off to the brain the brain's receiving and whatever the signals the brain's uh, giving off to the gut the gut is is receiving essentially. So when I started to really dig deep into this, a lot of this stuff sort of back in my first business and understanding the emotion code and what that all means. And then sort of going through my own journey with gut health, 
then I, I think it was just through research by chance that I was looking at depression. I was like, surely, surely, like, why is everyone depressed? Like, what is that? Mm. So I looked at it from a physical point of view and understanding our microbiome. So obviously the different types of gut bacteria that we have, the diversity of it or lack of, um, can often dictate what mood we are going to be in daily mm. and can also dictate the types of decisions that we make. So if I go back to, um, I guess, the times where I was quite low about money and all of this sort of stuff, I looked at just exactly how I was managing those low points and I managed it through alcohol. I managed it through takeouts. I managed it through um, lack of food and the foods that I did eat was quite high in sugar. And that was consistent to a point. It was my chronic strategy every single time. Mm. So you can imagine if the gut was constantly fed the same thing over and over again, where's the diversity? There's no versatility in there. Therefore, the good bacteria often goes like this, and then the bad bacteria is like being fed with sugar, essentially. So the more your gut cells are exposed to sugar, all different types of sugar, by the way, um, it's more for them to breed on, build their colonies, build their armies inside uh, sort of your digestive system, the, your digestive tract, to a point where it's like, oh, crap, my knees hurt or my joints hurt or my skin's flared up. And then we end up trying to deal with them separately, but it's actually not. It it does stem from one area and it's just outbreaking in all sorts of different areas. And to touch your point, what you said earlier about, I suppose we're talking about fulfilment in life generally. Um, if we're not feeling fulfilled, we try and fill it with all sorts of crap. And by crap, I mean, you know, the easiest things that we can do. Maybe we jump from one relationship to another. Maybe it's just sex. Maybe it's like uh, adrenaline stuff to get our adrenaline pumping, our, you know, the happy stuff that we want to achieve in that short space of time. Maybe it's drugs. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's over-exercising because that can also uh, cause a lot of uh, problems and inflammation in the body if there's too much oxidative stress going on. All sorts of things which ultimately between the gut and the brain causes a disbalance which means it causes dysbiosis dysbiosis meaning in simple terms imbalanced bacteria mm. so therefore the seesaws like all over the place and it's not kind of leveled in that aspect so your nervous system's constantly fight flight or freezing um your neurotransmitters all over the place and therefore um you've got microbes and all the chemicals are just firing left, right, and center. So essentially, when we're looking at the, the link between depression and gut health, you've got to imagine that what are you doing physically is affecting how this is responding to how it's responding here. So if we're waking up feeling sluggish and we feel sluggish, chances are there's some sluggish hormones going on and they're just not functioning in the best way that they should be. So yeah, mm. so it's how do we how do we how we take how do we take the pressure off is what I'm trying to say. How do we f reduce the feelings of that depressiveness, the low mood, and how do we increase more sort of um, uplifting thoughts, uplifting choices? Um, and essentially, it's not sort of popping a pill down your throat and thinking, yeah, this is going to be amazing, because even mm. just that, that one little tablet, an antibiotic, can change your gut bacteria for an entire year, which we don't even realise. Because yeah. there's a lot of chemicals just in that one pill. Yeah, it's interesting. Again, when I was preparing for this, you know, I was I was looking at um, obviously the effect that antibiotics can have on the brain yeah. via, via the gut, of course. And it was saying something like, if you've ever had more than five courses of antibiotics in your life uh it can cause you know se severe long-term or lifelong depression mm. and i was thinking well how many how many courses of antibiotics did i have in the 18 years that i was on them because i had acne right and i thought well i was probably I probably on average i probably had 10 courses a year 
over 18 years, it's probably 180 courses of antibiotics. And they were saying that five could potentially cause lifelong depression. Yeah. How did you feel about that when you read that? Like, because I just thought, yeah, I just thought, wow, I'm, I must be quite fortunate because I've never, I've never had depression. Right. No, not even for a day. I don't think I've ever had depression. I mean, yes, you might, I might feel sad, like, you know, family dog died or something, Mm. but you know, you, you grieve and you get over it, you move on. But, um, one thing I want to come back to, so someone might be listening to this and they might be thinking, what, what do you mean the gut and the brain is linked? Can you explain a bit more about how they're linked? How they're linked. So in, in what aspect from what I just said before to now? So I'm talking how they're physically linked. Yeah. Like like the vagus nerve, for instance. Yeah. So you've got the vagus nerve. Essentially, the vagus nerve has about 100 million trillion cells within it that are all messengers that, like I said, there's messages from the gut to the brain and then the brain to the gut. Uh, So they fire up a lot of signals. Even understanding the circadian rhythm, meaning your sleep patterns, is another way to understand the gut brain link. So if 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 anyone's listening to this right now that you're struggling with sleep as an example or your brain doesn't seem, seem to switch off in that aspect then you know that there's some form of communication going on between the gut and the brain and a sleep's a very good indicator of that. Some people are waking up in the middle of the night multiple times going for a wee when it's not actually normal to do that. Um, And it tells you, it's actually telling you that the gut brain connection is actually telling you to look at specific organs. And I teach a lot of this in the gut intuition as to if you're waking up at specific times, we've got to look at different organs of the body. Yeah. You know, if we're waking up between one and three, we've got to look at the liver here, because essentially that's where the liver is sort of doing its detoxification processes. It's got about like 200 processes to do every day. But add that on top with heavy meals and alcohol and, you know, working both candles at, you know, both ends, um, that affects, that puts a lot of pressure on the body. So the gut-brain connection is a very clever system. And it's if you look at the digestive system, if you look at the gut itself, it's actually a very independent system when it's working really, really, really well. The problem lies is in the normal day-to-day stuff that we do so for example diet the amount of sugar how we're moving um even mold in our homes can affect us as well but i think that's a podcast for another day um which i've which i've already done by the way yeah there you go um and so many other things like uh stress how we're managing our stress stress levels um essentially affects how the gut brain connection works as well um so yeah like it's just, I think one of the questions I was really asking, can gut health cause or worsen depression? Or is it the other way around? And I think it, it works both ways because of mm. how it's a two-way communicate. It's a two-way relationship, yeah. which is constantly getting divorced all the time. So. <laughs> and how does how does things like gut permeability affect the, the link between the two? So gut permeability is all about, like, if you under... If, the best way I can explain this is I want you to imagine a nightclub, right? And the door, the security, that, don't worry. yeah, the security guard, yeah. You've done a little, you know, back in your DJ days, right? Uh, which you, I assume you still do, but the, the, the security guards at the front checking one's, everyone's ID. Essentially, that's how gut permeability works. The microvillis mm. are the security guards. They don't let anything and everything through. They check it out pass through yep you can go here you can go there but when that gets damaged the microvilli the security guard's no longer there and the reason why it gets damaged is constant dis-ease and inflammation and when that inflammation switch is constantly on it becomes chronic inflammation meaning that microvilli just gets damaged over time so gut permeability goes down way down so guess what everything that we're eating just gets passed through and then you can see all sorts of things. So, you know, I've worked with clients who've seen food in their stools, so it's not being properly digested. Um, people getting all sorts of problems with sleep, all sorts of problems with just constipation and diarrhea or both at the same time, which is 
it can happen uh, all sorts of problems um so gut permeability is, is very important to keep it strong but therefore that's where our immune system gets attacked as well so our immune system's all over the place because inflammation set switches are on imagine imagine going to the supermarket and someone spilt something on aisle number 10 the cells will come and do their job they'll they'll you know they'll do all the sort of cleaning up but if there's a signal failure and something's not being cleaned up properly then that's when the red light is is constantly on mm. makes sense yeah so are you are you familiar with uh, lipopolysaccharides lipopolysaccharides yes takes me back a long time ago yeah <laughs> what's your question so do you do you know what their connection is with the gut brain barrier gut brain barrier uh you'll have to oh, jump sorry, on gut, brain, bit gut, there. gut brain access so yeah so basically when you when you have a dysbiosis and you have um like a an excessive amount of what's called gram negative yeah. bacteria yeah. They 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 release lipopolysaccharides, yeah. which is a which is a toxin, yeah. and that's one of the things that can create yeah. that low grade chronic inflammation that you were talking about. Hundred percent, yeah. So this takes me back to um, when I started learning about lipopolysaccharides, and just if we have a massive gym workout, and we are hurting for about a good week and a half, that's not a good sign. Yeah. That means there's a lot of life with polysaccharides. There's a lot of inflammation that's going on in our in our bodies, uh, and the clearance is not as good as it should be. That's another clear sign of the gut brain connection being compromised, and just clearance. So essentially, if if I take if I take you back to my twenties, Lee, I did a lot in the gym. I used to train like a guy. Like I was like, yeah, I want I want to train my legs and all this sort of stuff, but. I realised how much pressure I'd put on the gut-brain connection back then that I didn't know that I was doing um, and just thought, yeah, diet and exercise, great. Just keep on top of those two things. Don't worry about any of it. And the only way I could get a good night's sleep is if I've overtrained because I'm that knackered. Yeah. And again, that's not – these were all telltale signs that I didn't know at the time – I'm 37 now, so we're we're talking more than 10, 15 years ago. But these were all telltale signs that made me realise that, holy crap, I've been doing it all wrong anyway. But that's okay. I can do it right now, now that I've got the information of how my body actually functions and how it wants to be functioned and loved. Do you see what I mean? Mm. Again, it's not a cookie-cutter approach. It's, It's Even if we go down sort of the gym world and nutrition world, everyone's got a guide to give you or everyone's got a plan to give you i was like but do you even know that plan's going to work for you Mm. like how you function up here to how you function every day does this even work with the lifestyle that you're living right now and that's one of the key things we always look at in the gut intuition is the history of that person the health history of that person what kind of lifestyle they leave uh are they leading with we've worked with people that don't even are not even in the UK for long enough. They're always traveling everywhere. So what can we do with that? It's not about going, no, we'll work on your gut health later. No, the work still starts, but we work with you, not against you, if that makes sense. Yeah. That's the beauty of understanding how delicate and intricate and specific gut brain connection actually is. That's why when we're talking about mental health and we're talking about all those other different types of conditions, it's absolute paramount for the expert to actually look and ask better quality questions to in order to help that person come out of the pain to get to the other side. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So one of, one of the um, neurotransmitters that we know has quite a big effect on mood is serotonin. Yeah. What's, what's your view on the use of um, SSRI drugs for people with depression? Hmm. So when I learned about SSRIs and I learned that, you know, we got the we got the neurons um, connecting one another and they've studies have shown that obviously someone that's got depression labeled with depression, shown that the, those neurons don't really fire against one another. And SSRIs generally do that. But actually, I've learned with SSRIs, it, it deprives the body 
not necessarily ignites the two neurons to work and communicate better. So essentially serotonin, about 80% of it is in in and around the gut. It's produced by that. Mm. And a lot of people think, no, serotonin's up here. It's a small amount of it. Yeah. So uh, in my humble opinion, I don't think SSRI is the way forward. If we look at the most simplest things that give you the quickest wins, well, let's just look at diet, for example. Single ingredient foods. What what do I mean by single ingredient foods? I mean like broccoli is broccoli. That's a single ingredient food. Um, peppers are peppers. Onion is onion. Garlic is garlic. Um, having a look at that and just making some simple changes with that. Not that the fact that it's overwhelming, but just making some small changes with that. Maybe look at your bedroom because we have so many digital devices like phones and laptops everywhere flashing all sorts of different lights that can affect how we're sleeping, mm. how much rest we're getting, or are we sleeping in constant fight or flight all the time? That kind of doesn't work. That doesn't even work together because you should really, we should really be in rest and digest and recovery mode when we're sleeping. But most of the time we can't switch off because too many blinky lights are going off and our sleep hygiene's all over the place. Mm. So even if we just looked at just diet and sleep for example two the biggest quickest wins you could ever have if we did it right if you'd really committed to getting it right can really really help with all of that yeah are you a personal trainer exercise professional or medical professional who wants to upskill and take your knowledge to the next level and would you like to take a class and be taught personally by me I'm, of course, talking about Czech Integrative Movement Science Level 1 in Lancashire, England, on the 25th to the 29th of October 2023. I'll be teaching a clinically tested system that makes sense of the entire health and fitness journey, from anatomy to assessment to program design and coaching. You will learn 40 assessments, 60 conditioning exercises, and 27 program design principles. And the Czech framework brings them all together into an incredibly adaptable and effective system. From assessments to exercises to program design and coaching, this is a complete system. Students who master that system can create powerful programs that are tailored specifically to their individual client's needs, abilities, and motivations. If you're serious about your work and want to take it to the next level, you can enroll on Czech Integrative Movement Science Level 1 with me in Lancashire in the north of England on the 25th to the 29th of October 2023. And you'll need to enroll by the end of June to complete the three fantastic prerequisite online classes, program design, scientific core conditioning and scientific back training that will prepare you greatly for your IMS1 class. For more details, check out the link in the show notes, but don't delay. Places are limited. I hope to see you there. I think I think I can speak on your behalf when I say we're not telling anyone to not take SSRIs because we're not medical doctors. 100%. Um, But what I think possibly, I'm guessing possibly isn't fully understood with a lot of medical doctors working in that field, is that your microbiome is in control of the production of serotonin. Yeah. Right? So if someone's got a dysbiosis, well, guess what? You're not going to have optimum levels of serotonin in the brain. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So... You know, that could be in some situations that might be a better approach to address yeah. the gut rather than just, oh, here's a pill. Yeah. Come back and see me in six weeks kind of thing. Yeah, right. I agree. And absolutely, like, I would always, my way of working with health is always looking at the root. So if it's naturally produced in the body, why are we not looking at that first? What's causing the lack of production of serotonin for example or anything that we're talking about you know rather than not looking at that and then maybe adding a pill on top of that don't get me wrong it has its uses especially in extreme cases or in acute problems it does have its uses but what i'm saying is that the body is such a wonderful uh machine it's such a wonderful thing it's a self-healing place right that we live in why are we not utilising it better? If we if we take ourselves back to, you know, a few years ago when the whole world was going a bit crazy, you know, we're talking about the immune system a lot here. Why why are we not educating the masses about 
how does the immune system work? How can we look after it better? It's there. Yeah. You know, so yes, I I do believe there's a there's a time and a place for everything, but I am a big believer in understanding that what is the root? Always go back to the root. I see health as a massive puzzle and there's so many different puzzle pieces to to it. It's never just one thing. Yeah. You know, how you do one thing is how you do everything is I'm a, I'm a big believer in that. Um so I always anyone that's listening, I just encourage you to um just have look outside the box a little bit with your health you know mm. be a bit curious be a, do your due diligence do your research that's okay speak to as many experts as you want to mm. um and you know people will have a lot of opinions about certain things but ultimately the decision always lies with you we talked yeah. about choice uh, earlier in 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 this in this podcast and i just think it's important that rather than just seeing it one way question it look at it another mm. way and another way, you're in control the whole time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would say if you're not sure, get advice from people yeah. that are giving you different advice yeah. and sit with that yeah. and then decide what you think will be best for you. Yeah, 100%. Rather than, oh, I've spoken to one person, therefore they must be right. Yeah. And if anyone questions it, they must be wrong. Yeah. Yeah, right? exactly. It's been It's been quite frustrating for me the last three years because – you know, I, I know what I can do to help someone improve their health in six months. Yeah. Right. Now the um the medical experiment that I can't mention for censorship reasons, um, I think it came out was it eight, nine months after this whole crisis kicked off. Mm -hmm. You think how many people, if they've got the right education at that point, could have got themselves so healthy and robust in that period of time. Yeah. But what happened? Well, the government gave all our money away to the pharmaceutical industries, right? Yeah. When it would have cost peanuts in comparison to actually teach people how to take responsibility for their own health. Yeah. Now, whilst we talk about that, one of the things I did look at earlier was that in 2019, in the UK, 10% of people were uh, classed as depressed. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of 2021, it was 17%. So, so during, sorry, 2021, yeah. it was uh, 17%. So it does kind of show, I mean, I'm sure that wasn't just down to people who were eating a poorer diet. Yeah. I'm sure that was obviously down to the psychological operations that were going on as well. Yeah. But um, and and it's and from what I've heard, that you know, it's not gone anywhere near back down to ten percent. It's just you know going up and up and up. I don't know if it's continuing to go up. Yeah, I think it has come down a little bit since two thousand twenty-one. But um, that's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. I'm a big fan of questions. Mm. And I often think about, okay, what sort of questions did that particular expert ask in order the in order for them to put that person in a particular depression category for mm. it to jump from ten to seventeen percent in like two years? You know what are we asking really to tick all the boxes so that person's now, yeah, that person's got depression, mm. yeah, they go in they go into this category here, yeah, next, okay, you tick that box, you tick if you tick one more box. You're in the depression category. Yep, they did. Right, they go into the depression category. So yeah. I still would, you know, I would love to know. I would love to know a bit more in depth uh, as to how mm. they're asking these questions to classify that particular group of people as yeah. depressive people. Yeah. I can imagine, though, obviously, people being locked down in their homes, people losing their businesses. Yeah. You know, their their children not being at school and they're having to homeschool. Mm people having to wear masks over their face. Yeah. You know, all those things I'm sure definitely made a difference. I mean, to go from 10% to 17%. It's massive. It's almost double. Yeah, almost. Right? Yeah. So what would you say are the key things that people need to do to reduce depression-like symptoms? Yeah. I, I think rather than going down sort of, complicated routes because I find that a lot of people 
don't realise what, what they've already got at this moment in time. So what they're already doing. And I think we mentioned it throughout our time together in this podcast. Um, and I'll bring it back up again. So first and foremost, how are you fueling yourself? Meaning the foods that you're eating. And essentially... I'm a big believer in how you start your morning is pretty much how you're going to finish your evening. And how you finish your evening is how you start your morning. And what I mean by that is if we're not eating something in the morning or we're not fueling ourselves in the right way, whatever the right way works for you, um, you will have those afternoon crashes, so to speak. You will feel a little bit tired. By the evening, you're like completely crashed out. No energy left over. And And I'm talking from experience, by the way. And I just go for a quick fix. And because it's quick, it's convenient, it's yummy. We all latch on to that feeling. It's like, yeah, that was quick. That saved me a lot of time. I can just keep doing what I want to do. And we keep repeating that cycle. And it's the it's breaking that pattern, whatever that pattern is. And I had to break that pattern because I was consuming probably close to 150 grams, 180, maybe 200 some days of sugar just from throughout the whole day. That's a lot. That's that's more than I would have in a year. Yeah, exactly. Hence why I got the infection, Lee. <laughs> That's <laughs> why I do what I do now. So, you know, don't make the same mistakes as I did. But for the quickest wins, just have a look at what you're eating. That's number one. Number two, just have a look at just how your bedroom is set up, okay, in terms of sleep hygiene. A lot of people watch telly before they go to bed. I used to do that years ago. I couldn't really switch off without watching something and then I'd fall asleep and realise that the telly's still on at three o'clock in the morning. So it's disturbed me. I've had to open my eyes to artificial light, switch it off and then try and go back to sleep and now I can't sleep again. Mm. So really, really look at how many digital stuff is in your room right now and just remove them completely and just have a bedroom that is just literally got black eye bl- uh, blinds or whatever you've got curtains and just draw them and, and allow your body to move away from the fight or flight and actually move from rest to digest and sort of 60 to 90 minutes just have no digital time before you go to bed we need natural sunlight night and day that's how our body's rhythm is um it favors that that's that's how it that's how it kind of rises to the sun and then slows down at around six seven o'clock at night this is all to do with the circadian rhythm but guess what we've got so much artificial lighting these days because we live in a digital age so all these red lights blue lights green lights white lights constantly at us thinking that the body's getting these signals and messages going it's still daylight actually it's 10 o'clock at night it's time to go to sleep. So definitely look at diet. Sleep hygiene is really important. And move. Um, back, reason why I say that is because back in my 20s, I thought gym work was the best way to move your body. And actually, yes, it has its purpose, of course. But the best way I understood movement was just for me, for my body at the time, was actually to walk every day. OK, get get at least half an hour, an hour's walk. And the first I love getting up in the morning and just going for a walk because I'm getting I'm exposing my body to natural daylight, which essentially is going to help me throughout the day and help me with my circadian rhythm by the evening. Mm. Yeah. Um, moving your body, essentially your body is designed to move. It's not designed to be static. Just sitting here, like even if you're on your laptop and you're in a Zoom meeting for half an hour, you don't realise how traumatic that is for the body. The body's like, can you move? Your hips are like, can you just move a bit more? You know, we're not designed to move. We go back to the caveman days or, you know, where we used to hunt for our food. There was movement every single day. Mm. But we seem to have slowed down as time has moved on. That's going to happen. But actually more so now where everything's so convenient, everything's so accessible that we do need to move our bodies a lot more. If you just did those three things and just got into the habit of doing those three things, not nothing overwhelming and just making some subtle changes, you'll notice a massive difference. Hugely, if you, if you really commit to it, you'll notice a massive difference in in probably less than 30 days if you really, really commit to it every single day. 
there's yeah. many other ways like even with diet that helps with sugar levels go down and you know help them uh, help them maintain at a constant level so they're not fluctuating too much yeah yeah one thing i would add to you know what you were saying about diet just make small changes yeah one of the things that i really like is and again this is a a, a paul check ism if it wasn't around ten thousand years ago don't eat it yeah right because you know we've been evolving for at least six million years as as humans it's probably a lot longer than that if you listen to people like greg braden yeah but um you know that's how that's how our bodies have evolved eating that stuff so if you're eating stuff that we didn't evolve eating it's going to make you sick yeah like you were saying you know one ingredient foods right yeah you know if it's got a label i would first of all you might want to question whether you have it at all yeah. but if it has got a label make sure you check it and it's yeah you know you can pronounce the words on the ingredients because if you can't again you probably don't want to be eating you took the words right out of my mouth so one of the one of the things i've always done as a kid is look at the ingredients of foods because i'm just i'm just curious i was like what's in here and look a lot of the gluten-free stuff that are on the shelves if you look at it endless amounts of ingredients in there ease and whatever it is i'm like nah it's clever marketing. I get it. Gluten free, fat free, sugar free, you know, whatever, wheat free. But when you really deep dive and look into it a lot deeper as to, okay, how is this loaf of bread made up? What's in it? And why is it lasting so long? Then I'd really, really question it and think about if you can't pronounce those words, just don't eat it. Yeah, definitely. So, so it's quite so it's quite interesting. So in terms of what people can do, so you mentioned diet. You mentioned sleep. You mentioned movement. Yeah. What's quite interesting, I don't know, and I don't know if you're familiar with Czech's um, six foundation principles. Enlighten me. Okay. So, and these are in a, a sequence. Yeah. And you have to have all six principles in place to be healthy. If, you, if you're not doing one of them, you're not going to be optimally healthy. Number one is your thoughts. Mm. Number two is breathing. Number three is hydration. And then you've got nutrition, exercise, and sleep. Yeah. Right? So you're, what you were saying was that people need to follow three of the six foundation principles. Yeah. Now, obviously, thoughts is an important one if you're depressed. Yeah. Right? And it's I can understand. I mean, I have had clients that were depressed. And it's a real challenge for them to think positively. Yeah. And as human beings, we are programmed to think negatively because that can potentially save our life. You know, if you're if you're on the plains of Africa and you look down and you think, is that branches that have fallen off a tree or is that a brown snake? It's best to be pessimistic, right? Yeah. Because if you if you think, oh, I'll 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 bend down and I'll pick up that stick, and it turns out to be a snake, that could be a fatal decision. Yeah. Right, so we are programmed. I think it's. I think we have something along the lines of uh, twenty-four thousand nine hundred thoughts a day, mm -hmm. of which ninety percent of them are negative. Yeah. Right. But one of the things that I try and do with my clients is get them to start training or even brainwashing themselves to start to think positively. Yeah. Right. So things like affirmation statements can be really useful. Mm -hmm. But also, before you can do that, the thing that you have to do is to work out what's the what's the person's goal what do you want to achieve in life yeah right because if there's no if there's no destination well which way are you going to go yeah you've got to have a, you've got to have the goal in mind oh, do you know what i love it because if i really draw it back as to why someone has negative thoughts or depressive thoughts or just generally unhappy it's because i feel as if we don't even know it. We've actually bottlenecked our lifestyles. We might be in jobs that don't give us enough autonomy mm. or enough career progression. That's one way. Or we've tried to do all ourselves in business and realized that, oh, crap, I don't have money to invest now in a mentor. What do I do now? And so many other, other ways. And I just think that, yes, being happy is one thing, but I think fulfillment is another what are we doing right now that is absolutely filling our cups up? Like, 
that for those of that are listening to this podcast, like honestly, just it's one of the most powerful questions uh, that was asked to me from uh, a few years ago from one of my mentors. Like, what absolutely lights you up? Like in the morning, you wake up and you're like, I can't wait to get going. You know, like, oh, I really can't wait to get going and just just help that person or or work on this creative project. There's not enough creativity. The more creativity we have in our in our world of what absolutely lights us up, play to our strengths. This is where fulfillment comes in. There's no any chance for a depressive thought to come in, even enter, because we're like, no, I'm on my road. I know what I'm doing. There's direction there's an outcome that we want to achieve and we're not going to do anything to stop us to get us there. So I think people want this work-life balance, as I mentioned earlier, which is total BS, but that's another conversation for another day. But there's ha- people want to be happy. Yeah, I'm happy, you know, you know, pays the bills, whatever. But I take it to the next level. I was like, what does absolutely fulfill you, light mm. you up? Mm. Well, that reminds me of um, a famous saying by um psychologist called Jerry Wesh. And he says, if you have a big enough dream, you don't need a crisis. Mm. Yeah. That's exactly what you were just explaining, yeah. right? And it does make me wonder, and I'm sure I'm sure the research hasn't been done, mm. but it would be quite interesting to see what percentage of people with depression have a clearly defined life goal. Yeah. I, I would imagine it would be relatively slim. Yeah, I would. I would agree with you. I, I really, uh, it's there's no postcode on the map just yet for them. It's mm. it's they it's it's like their thinking is just here. It's all over the place, but that's the reason why they go down in seeking support from therapists, seeking from support from physical health therapists to actually get them back on track again, whatever that track looks like for them. You yeah. know, so yeah, hundred percent. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah. For anyone listening to this that's got depression, if you haven't got a life goal, make sure you get one. Yeah. Um, the next, the next, or the second principle on on, on the six foundation principles is, is breathing. Yeah. Now, breathing has a big effect on mood, mm. right? And you know, you mentioned earlier the fight or flight state, and of course, if you're in a state of stress, generally your breathing speeds up. Yeah. And you start breathing into the chest and your shoulders go up as you breathe in. Well, if you can go somewhere quiet, lay down, put your hand on your tummy, breathe in and out of the tummy. So as you breathe in, the tummy should get bigger. And as you breathe out, the tummy should get smaller. Yeah. Yeah. And and just really relax. That can have a massive effect. 100%. I am. So I do a lot of this in between, like, especially when I'm working from home. Any chance I get, especially on a busy day, I will literally lie down and try and relax every part of my body. And the one area that gets a lot of tension is up here and here. So as soon as I let go, I can really feel it. I'm like, oh, you've been carrying a lot today. Let's Mm -hmm. release that. And one of the key things I teach a lot with clients is body scanning. If you lie on your back and you just scan from head to toe or you know, head, uh, toe to head, whatever, whichever way we work at it, you can probably sense where you're holding the most tension and just allow yourself to just f- completely be vulnerable and just let go. Just for those few seconds, just let go. And for me, it's always been up here in my shoulders and up here. And I think a lot essentially is like I carry a lot of responsibility given what I do, but that doesn't dictate who I am and how I want to carry, like be every single day. That's just day-to-day management side of things. But body scanning, if anyone's listening, it's just a, just a fascinating way of really looking at where you're carrying a lot of tension and where you can actually release it. It's part of self-healing mode anyway, you know? So yeah, yeah incredible, incredible uh, uh, strategy to use. Yeah. And even, I mean, a massage would be would get a similar I do love response massage. as well, right? Yeah. But if you, <laughs> if you don't have a massage therapist on hand, I'm talking about, you know, the moments where it's a bit stressful throughout the day and you're like, what, yeah. what is the quickest way I can just really allow myself to just breathe, calm my nervous system down and just release the tension and just lying on the ground or lying on the bed or, or even just sitting on a chair and just closing your eyes. And like you said, Lee, Deep breathing in, deep breathing out. Even if it's two minutes, five minutes, 
your body will thank you for it forever. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And the the, the, the final uh, foundation principle, hydration. Yeah. Now, obviously, you know, all biochem- biochemical reactions in the human body require water. Yeah. So if you're, if you're dehydrated, your brain's not going to work function. Yeah. Know, it's not going to function properly. The other thing is, if you're drinking tap water, which has got chlorine in it, which is a sterilant, yeah. will sterilize your gut microbiome, which will mean you'll end up with a dysbiosis, which means you're more likely to get depression. Yeah. So, you know, there are lots of, well, I say lots, there are good filtration systems out there. Yeah. Um, if you want to filter your water at home, certainly certainly cheaper than buying bottled water and there's issues with bottled water as well plastics yeah yeah Yeah. um so yeah you know when you look at the six factors you can look at that with any condition yeah you know they're they're really important absolutely and one of the things i use is uh quality charcoal in my water Mm. that draws out a lot of the impurities in in water as well um and i just carry it with me everywhere i go if i'm traveling or whatever it is it's always with me it's my go-to because anything as little as three percent dehydration probably less that has massive impairment on your performance how you're thinking how you're feeling so water is absolutely a must majority of us is is made up of water 70% 70% yeah. or more. So yeah. uh, you'd be, we'd be crazy not to continue feeding ourselves good quality hydration, hydrated water. Like, it's, yeah, yeah it, it goes without saying, but they're all linked uh, together. But I always love working is that what's the quickest win you can get right now that's going to be helping you long term. Yeah. But then the other ones where we talk about the thoughts and the emotions will have essentially will come in. Um, in the right time so yeah great so i know i know we're a little pushed for time yeah but before before we wrap up is there anything else you'd like to add to the listeners i think i hope you got value out of today's podcast um that thank you lee again for inviting me on the radical health uh, rebel podcast it's been an absolute honor um do feel free to ask questions because it's not it's not right or wrong, it, you know, it's just opening up conversation as to how we can approach health in such different ways. Um, it doesn't have to be in one way. I'm a big believer in there's always another way. Always. It's it's the biggest thing I believe. I'm actually working on my book at the moment and I'm, I'm, I'm actually giving a lot of information, uh, balanced information that is just has a no BS approach to, to some of the stuff that we spoke about today. And I'm just doing a much deeper dive into it. So Hopefully with the tips that we've given uh, can help you essentially have less of the low mood crashes and know that um, there are much simpler ways that are easily accessible to actually getting yourself over that hurdle of depression um, or any other type of mental health condition just to get you closer and closer to your goal, whatever that goal is. But do do make sure that you work on what the goal is that you want to achieve in the next 30 days to the next 60 days, to the next 90 days. I think consistent small chunks is always better than looking at the next year or five years. I think that can be quite overwhelming for some people, yeah. um, particularly yeah. if your thoughts are here, there and everywhere. If you just looked at it for the next seven days, that's seven days that you've worked mm-hmm. and created momentum for yourself. And then the next seven days become 14 days and 14 days become 30 days. And before you know it, you've just consistently worked at it for month after month. So I think just working with those type of strategies is is, is much, much better than just standing still and feeling like there's no other help out there. Just let this podcast be that that sort of help for you. So Great. Yeah. Just one just one more thing I want to add actually. There is quite a lot of evidence suggesting that probiotics. Mm-hmm. Um, can can dramatically reduce yeah. depression as well, yeah, yeah. which makes sense. You know, we're saying dysbiosis can cause depression, yeah. so therefore you'd expect probiotics, prebiotics. Company that I I use a lot of their supplements, they actually have a specific supplement, and it's called uh, Mind and Mood, mm. and it's a pro it's a probiotic supplement. Yeah, um, that's in vivo healthcare. Yeah, um, so there's a, there's a lot of research in that. So that's another option as well for people. Yeah, hundred percent. I love I love kombucha drinks um there's some really nice ones that are out at the moment uh, been out for some time but uh, living strong or living well one of them uh, are really really good it's actually uh 
ex rugby player, forgotten his name, but went into the sort of the kombucha gut health kind of arena and produced a lot of these drinks. Uh, might have been Johnny Wilkinson, I'm not sure, but is it, Dan, is it um, Haskell? Possibly. Quite a few of them have gone down this road um, and produced yeah. a lot of um, just quality, uh, affordable kombucha drinks. Um, mm. But yeah, probiotics definitely, and, and there's a lot of evidence that show that these can be really, really helpful. So yeah, cool. Yeah. And what's next for you, Shim? Uh, like I said, um, I have been writing my book for the last ten weeks, so that's been going to be launching um, this year um, in sort of the winter months. I don't want to give away too much, but uh, by the end of August, I should have the book fully written. Um, and I'm doing a lot of work in terms of uh, collaborations and partnerships because I want to help as many people with gut health. Doesn't matter where they are, whether they're business owners, doesn't matter. It's just I want I, I want to help people as much as possible in understanding the state of their gut through good testing and good mm -hmm. strategies to work on for the long term, so that they are getting there a lot quicker. Uh, and not with short-term results, but long-term results. So, yeah, I've got lots of things going in the background, but, yeah, stay tuned. I'll definitely be sharing more with you, Lee. Cool. Awesome. And where can people find you online? Uh, LinkedIn is the best place to find me. I, I do share a lot of my articles, uh, my thoughts. Uh, Facebook also, but LinkedIn is usually where I'm kind of hanging out. Um, by, by all means, just, uh, yeah, drop me a message, say hello, tell me where you came from, which which podcast, um, and drop me and say hello. And any questions you've got specifically uh, about some of the topics that we spoke about today, um, yeah, feel free to reach out and, uh, yeah, we'll have a chat. So. Cool. And I'll make sure your social media links are in the show notes Brilliant. as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome stuff. Shim, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with myself and the listeners today. You're welcome. So that's all from me and Shim for this week. But don't forget, you can join me same time, same place next week on the Radical Health Rebel podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Remember to give the show a rating and a review, and I'll see you next time. <laughs>